Hi, this is Diane Carbo with Caregiver Relief, and today we have Kim Doviak Van Hassel with me. Kim is a caregiver coach, a podcast contributor, and she has graciously agreed to care of her caregiving journey. I'm going to give a little synopsis of our last call with Kim. Kim is an only child with two parents who became ill. She did long-distance caregiving for a few years and had a little bit of help in, not a lot, only a few hours, I think, in the beginning. Then she had uh, a situation where her mom fell and her whole life changed. So this brought us on to another difficult chapter, one that would change their lives forever. Kim, I'm so excited and, and grateful that you're sharing this because your journey is like many caregiver's journeys. One of the most emotionally complex and difficult things any person can do is experience taking care of an elderly parent. And you did it all. So I'd like to start with you, Sherry. What happened and how your life changed after your mom fell? Thank you, Diane, for sharing my story to others. I feel that my parents had so much love for each other. I love the fact that they're going to be heard. Their love story is going to be heard over the internet. I'd like to interject there that I helped take care of your parents. I have to tell you, I came to fall in love with your mom and dad. I'd like to share with people that I think one of the things that you did was you were very lucky because you had such good communications with your folks. And that was amazing. Your mom was a nurse. And your dad was a friend of Bill's. And if anybody doesn't know what that means, he was a lifelong <laughs> AA member. So you grew up with a lot of good communications in your family. Um, yes and no. There's a time in my teenage years I rebelled. Put them through a hard time. <laughs> No matter what they've been taught as far as communication, I'm sure I contributed to some of their illnesses later on. But it came full circle, and I really had this need to love and take care of them and be this family again that we were when I was young, except for they were older, and it was the three of us, my elderly parents and me. We just became a close family again until they passed away. You uh, did an amazing job, and you struggled. I know that we talked often, and, and you struggled. So let's get to the day where your mom fell and everything changed. Um, let's talk about that. I had been at their house for a couple of days. Mom needed some help getting to the doctor. She wasn't driving that well with her Parkinson's, and my dad wasn't driving at all anymore. So I took some to an eye doctor, get their eyes checked, and we got home. I sat on the couch, and I was resting. She was up doing a few things, which I didn't think she needed to be monitored at that point. But she fell hard, and I heard it. And I was on the phone. I had to drop the phone and go running, and there she was on the floor. In fact, I sent you a picture of that. There she was on the floor, and we didn't know what to do. We had hoped she broke anything or whether we should just try to get her up ourselves. When something like that happens, you should always call the emergency response because if she broke something, at least they're there to get her up and figure out what happened to any of her body. So yes, it was. it's important that people know that they shouldn't second-guess themselves. It, it's right. important that your family member be assessed by prof healthcare professionals because falls are the number one independence robber of seniors. And this fall robbed all their independence. This was the beginning of a whole new lifestyle for all of us. My mom refused to go to the ER. However, we called her Parkinson's doctor, and he got her into a rehab because he knew that she was falling a lot 
and he wanted to try to get her stronger and better to move on with the next part of her life. But while she was in rehab, she was having trouble breathing. She went in the hospital emergency room twice, and the second time, her oxygen levels were quite low. Apparently, from the fall, she either broke a rib or she got pneumonia from not being able to breathe deeply from the fall, and everything changed. She was in the emergency room for about 24 hours until they finally got her set in. I sat there with her. I stayed in Tom's River with them. I watched my dad while she was in the hospital in the rehab, but then went to the hospital. She stayed in the hospital for three weeks after that fall. They found out that she couldn't swallow. So Parkinson takes away the ability to swallow. Those muscles can't pull the fold down. And so instead, it goes into their lungs, and she developed aspiration pneumonia. After that, they told me that she can't eat anymore and that we had to make a decision. And the decision was feeding tube in her nose, a G tube in her stomach, or nothing, and that she would die if she got nothing. So I'm in the hospital with my mom. At the same time I'm in the hospital, my aunt's in the hospital and she's dying. My father's in the hospital for seizures. So I had all three of them in the hospital. I, I spoke, spoke to my mom about the feeding tube and to see how she felt. She didn't want feeding tubes. Yeah, exactly. But for some reason, when she came to that point, for life-sustaining measures, she didn't want to die. This is what people need to understand. You can put something in writing, and you need to have those conversations with your family members up until the point that you are still competent enough to tell people what you want. You have the ability to change your mind, and you hope that your family member that you've identified as your power of attorney will honor those wishes. And knowing the relationship between your mom and your dad, I, I can see where, because as a nurse, she knew that she was not going to get better. She was only going to decline. But she wasn't ready to leave your dad. No, not at all. They had a plan. The plan was he was going to die first and she was going to die next. And oh. they were sticking to it. She decided that she was going to live for my dad and me too because she knew it was hard losing a mother. But it was all her decision to get the G2. We discussed it. She said, I don't want to give up our family, the three of us. I want us to be together in a family. And I want the G2. So they gave her the G2. And she stayed in the hospital for three weeks trying to get her oxygen back up again and the pneumonia taken care of. And finally, she was able to be released to a rehab. We went to a different rehab this time. It was going to be for a while because she could not take care of herself. She could not feed herself. It, it was a tough time. She had been alone most of the time in that rehab. While I had to stay home and take care of my dad, I couldn't bring my dad with me all day. He right, he could tolerate it. No, he he wasn't well enough to sit there. So I had a caregiver coming in, and he stayed two two and a half hours. And in that time, I was able to run and see and take care of my mom for the next three months. I felt bad because I felt like. She needed an advocate there, and it was hard for me to do that. I was taking care of my dad. I think you really struggled a lot because I know it was a very difficult thing for you to go through. You had your own business, and so many daughters sacrificed their careers. You had the ability, because your parents had saved money, to be able to pay for care. You have this need, want, and desire, as well as your mom. You wanted to find and hold on to some treasured final moments with them. 
despite the overwhelming work of caring for them. And I think that you did that. You had terrible hardships, but you did it to make their final years comfortable. That was so perfectly said, and that's exactly what I wanted. It was very important for me to get through this time in their lives together. And I had just gotten married. I was hardly ever home. Um, my husband was very understanding. He had to work, so I was basically in Tom's River with them by myself. You did have the dog. <laughs> we got a chair. <laughs> You have you had three pups and a cat, yes. And I think that was a blessing for your dad because at least when you were gone to see your mom, the pups fawned over him and he got some attention and, and companionship from them while you were away those few hours. Oh, yeah. He got it while I was there, too. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> sit on his lap and climb up on his nest and wrap themselves around his neck. He just loved them so much. They brought him so much happiness. It was great therapy for him and me. Yeah, too. absolutely. And I know you were feeling guilty and I know that you were feeling frustrated and torn between the two parents at the time and your aunt as well. So I think that at least your dad was having some kind of comfort while you were gone, that you were with the love of his life, managing her care and advocating for her. And he was getting love, attention, and companionship from the, the pets while you were gone. But I know if you, you struggled with that. I know you did. And anybody would. And she came with me a few times. And they would sit there and just hold each other's hands. He couldn't stay long, but I had to bring him in for some visits, too. And they would just sit there and, and be so happy to be near each other. It was amazing that their love was so strong through all this. It, it's a beautiful love story, and it also is a testament to you because you accepted that things had changed. You were experiencing a radically new paradigm where you're old emotions and old relationships didn't work anymore. You had to parent your parents. Absolutely. That was my job. That was the only thing. If my business took a hit. I'd lost a lot of business. But that was the most important thing in my life at that moment. That yes. What I had to focus on, nothing else. It was hard. It, it was very hard, and I watched you struggle. But you reached out. You got help. You got support. I want to talk about your aunt dying and what a, a dramatic response that you had or lack of response from your parents that was hard for you to deal with. Oh, my God. They were so sick. And my aunt lived a half block away from my parents. They've been close. Ever since their early 20s, um, my dad was always close to his sister, and my mom was always close to his sister since their early 20s. And I told my mom that my aunt passed away. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know whether I should tell her or not, but I was feeling a little selfish, and I wanted to tell my mom. My aunt died, and I wanted a little comfort, but... I couldn't get that. My mom didn't even want to hear it. She was so sick and put up a wall that she refused to hear that her sister all died. It was very unusual. I've never seen her do that before. So there I was by myself dealing with the grief of my aunt. And my parents were unable to help me process through that. So that was a new part of my life where I'm on my own here. I don't have my mom and dad anymore to help me, that's gone. But that's okay because I was a frame of mind that I had to take care of them until their days are over with. This is an important point that I want other caregivers to understand is 
you have to expect nothing emotionally from a, an aging parent at the end phase of their life. They may or may not open up to you emotionally or spiritually. They may express love for you. Or they may even express anger for you. Uh, oh, yeah. And and you'll see that we'll talk about that as well because they've lived <laughs> the things that that they've always had in their relationship and they had authority with you, so it's not easy for them to give up that I'm the parent, you're the child. Uh, so expect them to lash out and lash out about that loss. It's also their grieving process as they come toward their end of life. It was quite difficult, but it was a lesson. And part of the whole story coming together and, and what I had to learn and what I had to learn was, yes, I was the parent now and I had to take care of them. And they did get angry quite a few times because they weren't always done the way they liked them. But you can't do things like you used to do when you were sick. And I'm taking care of two parents and... I have to take care of my animals while I'm there. It's a lot. It's overwhelming. And, and to refill their medication and to try to get help to come in. Eventually, when they released my mom from the rehab after three months, they said that she can't go home without in-home help 24-7. So I hired, at that point, I hired a full-time caregiver. It's what I really needed because I was taking care of both of them. And I, it's hard to do two people that are ill at once. I started hiring people to come in full time. I think the time I spent, we all, we all cycled. So everybody could get a break. You can't just work 24-7 for month after month. You need a break. So we all cycled. They got their time off. I would be there to watch them. And then I would get some time off and they would be there to watch them. And that wasn't easy either because caregivers are really almost never exactly how you want them to take care of your parents. That's, that's and, true. That's very true. And you have to do You were the best out of all of them. But you have to adjust to the new ways that they're taking care of them. And as long as their lives aren't threatened or they're not hurting them, that's good. Because well, one of the yes, um, because even in a nursing home, if I had put them in a nursing home together forever, I'd still have just as many problems or probably more problems. So there's always going to be issues dealing with caregivers. There absolutely is. I wanted to point out to the caregivers out there listening, one of the things you did was give your parents autonomy. You offered your parents options instead of orders. Like you didn't say to them, you have to do this. And you did that so well uh, because you don't want to come across as you're running. The you have to let them decide about their own care situation and ask for their advice. It's a way to show your parent love and respect. Right. And a way to affirm that you still value them. That is something that was really, I think, that you did and you did well. And um, you need to be acknowledged for that because it's really hard. So many caregivers want to tell their parents what to do. I know. And, and, and as the oldest and bossy sister that I'm, I'm accused of being, and my parents died young, so I, I didn't have this, the situations that many are are dealing with now, I've had to tell family members, you have to give choices, you have to have discussions, and you have to be patient. And you did, as hard as it was, and I know it was for you to be patient sometimes, you were able to, with your mom's Parkinson's, I'm sure she had a form of Lewy body dementia, it, it, eventually it came in to play. So you were able to separate their emotional dysfunction from their cognitive dysfunction. I think that was really hard for you, but you were able to do it. You saw that there were times when your mom wasn't responding appropriately to something or was acting inappropriately. And 
you addressed it. I, I will say that you were a person that you respected their love for each other, their emotions for each other, and for you as well. It was extremely difficult to separate the dementia from from having conversations that are rational. They both had. My father had vascular dementia, and and my mom had Parkinson's dementia, and sometimes they hallucinated. Not too often. They were always aware of themselves and, and their surroundings up until the day they died. They just had times where their brain did not work near as well as it should. And they would get angry. Most of my mother, because Parkinson's tends to be, the medication does, plays a lot of tricks with their brains. And it can make them a little angrier than average. Or they can't handle things. Part of the Lewy body dementia is the parts of the brain um, that are affected. And that's why they have the behaviors that they do and the instability with anger and frustration. Oh, yeah. It was tough. And there are times I just had to walk out of the room. And if there was another caregiver, just leave them with the caregiver. But it, the, the anger was probably the worst part about the whole thing. It's a difficult thing to deal with. I just had to learn how to adjust to it and, and say my mom's sick and this is not her. Yeah. And I kept saying that all the time to myself just so I could get through it and understand. It's so easy to react when somebody yells at you or, or says something nasty. But when you're dealing with dementia, that's a whole different story. It is, and I think that a lot of caregivers take it personally. I know for me, I've seen it so many times where the very person that's taking care of them, the primary caregiver, is abused emotionally uh, and berated by the care recipient, the person that they're caring for. Yes. They know that they can do that and get away with it, because they're going to stay there to be with them no matter what. Yeah. And my mom treated other people so much better than me. It was upsetting, but she knew I wasn't going to leave her. I remember walking into a room one day from in, in the nursing home, and she thought I was the nurse coming in that she liked, and she started saying all these nice things. And then when she realized it was me, she said, oh, it's you. <laughs> I like, I remember okay. you and I talking about that because you were so heartbroken. Yeah, but she couldn't really appreciate me. She had the Parkinson's also creates a selfishness about them. Yeah, I think that people don't understand or need to realize the caregivers need to realize as you're coming towards the end of your life, you focus on you. You focus on so many different things about your life. And when you're dealing with dementia as well, you lose rea a sense of reality. And that's hard. One thing that your parents had was each other. And they had that long-term relationship that lasted up until the very last breath of each one of them. Oh, yeah. They died three weeks apart. Oh, okay. And they both knew their surroundings at the time and they they both knew what was going on I even had that last conversation with my mom and she was more clear than she had been in months when we spoke actually even recorded that conversation but there are times they just know exactly what's going on and what's happening and then there are other times they can't know what's going on. they're not capable of figuring it out Exactly. One of the things, like when you walked into the room and your mom was sweet and then she was nasty, she's pushing emotional buttons. And we have to take time as caregivers. We have to put those buttons away, these emotional buttons that they can press and not allow them to cause us pain and harm. 
we're emotional. We have to do that for our own emotional well-being. Yes, very hard to do, but it it can be done. And I think you got to practice at it. And yes, I'm mean, going a chance to practice. Say to your mind, say in your mind, this is a practice moment where I can work on that. My mom didn't really appreciate what I was doing or, or didn't love me like she did when, before she got sick. She seemed like she just felt like I was going to be there and it didn't matter. She was the best mom growing up and loved me we were like best friends loved me intently we were so close we talked about everything we did a lot of things together but at this time in her life it was very hard to see that love that she had for me change i know she still had a seat inside she was just sick from the brain disease the, yes, part, not only was she sick from her Parkinson's, but she's also being robbed of her independence. She's being robbed of her ability to do what she wants when she wants. She's been robbed of her ability to take care of her father, which was in her plan, in her mind, the uh, goal was to take care of him till he died and then she could go. So there was, there's anger, there's frustration, and then there's cognitive deterioration due to her own dementia that causes her to lash out and take it out on the only person that really cared and loved her, and that's you. That's what it felt like, 100%. I felt like she was taking it out on me. I felt like she loved her caregivers more than me. Like I knew I just had to keep saying it was just her illness. She depended on her people. She actually grew really close to the caregivers because they were her lifeline. And because they were her lifeline, she got very close to a couple of them. There was one I wasn't happy with, but I couldn't remove her because my mom refused. She felt like she was her lifeline. She felt like without her, she couldn't be alive. But... That's not true. I was there. She didn't feel like that with me, but for some reason she did with her. There are caregivers out there that really struggle like you did with that. And people that have been the best managers in the world don't know how to deal with that when somebody, your, the caregiver your mom had, they're providing the most intimate care possible. And they're doing it in a way that's loving and caring, you would hope. And they right. develop a bond and a friendship at a time when the people that are getting the care, like your parents, need. And they don't want to give that up. No, that's their lifeline. They can't live without that person. They get them up, they feed them, they save them, which I did the same thing too. We all, we all took turns, but a stranger that she was so dependent on she couldn't live without her she did. yeah that's that's hard yeah and i wanted to get rid of her because i didn't feel her heart was really into it but my mom didn't care her she was still yeah. doing the work but it i mean it worked out and my mom got the care from her that she needed but it was never to my standard one of the things that I have to say is, again, to acknowledge that you listened to your mom, you respected her opinion and her point of view, you gave her autonomy and allowed her to make those choices, even if it was against what you wanted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to your detriment, as far as your own feelings, but that was a very a sincere effort on your part to show your mom that you still valued her. That meant a lot. That went a long way. Yeah, there was a couple of years with that caregiver. The sex caregiver got sick too a couple of times. And I tried to hire a company to come in. They weren't as good as when you find the caregiver through recommendation. But I had a, a couple of good people from the company, but 
when they develop a relationship and they know the patient, they're used to each other. When a stranger comes in, it's devastating. My mom and dad were so unhappy with this one caregiver I hired from a company. I needed to get home and do some things. So I, I hired this company to come in and apparently there was a clothing everywhere. It wasn't folded. Nothing was put back together correctly. And I walked into the house and the two of them were in the bedroom crying. They were just overreacting in my opinion. Their lives weren't threatened. They weren't in any kind of travel. She just couldn't fold the laundry. And I think that with their dementia, they just got overwhelmed. They had a stranger in the house. Having taken care of your parents and, and actually done hands-on care to give you a break, I, I have to tell you, your parents were characters. And I love them. Your mom was challenging at times. Your dad just was funny. Even at the end, he would never say anything negative or derogatory. He would just ignore me like I wasn't there. And let me, I, I can remember telling him, you take your walker with you. You need that walker. I don't want you falling on me. And he would look at me and he would look at me with such disdain. Excuse me, who do you think you are? Because, yeah, there's the boss inside of me. Uh, but he did it. He complied. God bless him. He did what he was told. I bantered with him. I bantered with him yeah. often because he still had a sense of humor and oh, enjoyed that. Yes. Yeah. Right up to the end. Your mom, she was always one to challenge anybody new. I know because I personally experienced that. I giggled because she would always question and challenge in the beginning. And I respected that. I was fine with that. Right. She had a period where she was suspicious of, of things. Did you do this? Did you do that? Part of that is her nursing background, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, part of it was her Parkinson's dementia. And she was always overseeing your dad's care. Oh, and, and her always. care. Did I get my pills? And even yeah. if she got her pills, she asked him another uh, 10 more times, did I get my pills yet? Here's a perfect example of, of, of like, I was doing a Christmas holiday for you. I can remember this because I just got the biggest giggle. I put them to bed and I'm sitting in the living room and I'm watching TV and you had a bell. <laughs> I'm not going to hear the bell again. Oh my God, I'll tell you. She was ringing that bell and I'd say, what do you want? Yeah. I'd go in, what do you need? And she would say, I just want to make sure you can hear it. <laughs> I can't bring it down. Oh, can you? I just, and, and because of her dementia, she would do it multiple times. Multiple times. Sometimes she did it so hard and so fast because she wanted something now. And, and she was just ringing that bell one right after another. It was crazy. And then the bell, it's just after a while, you want to take that bell and throw it away. Oh, money. I can relate to that. <laughs> because it's all you heard was the bell all the time. I'm not sure if it was a good thing to have that bell. You know what? In in the it's either that or she's gonna yell. I have dealt with so many patients over the decades of nursing that I've had and they're gonna yell, they're gonna do something. And this was it, it was a way to get attention in a dignified manner. And yes, did she abuse it? Of course. I, I <laughs> but you know what, I'm so used to that. And 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 her memory was getting shoddy at the time. The thing is I was refreshed. I was new on the scene. I was not having to deal with that day in and day out, 24-7 for years at a time. So I, I was okay with dealing with it. I, I looked at it as we can't change her perspective, but we can change ours. And my behavior was I would go in, I would respond, and I looked at it as I'm just getting more steps in for the day. <laughs> You know, getting my exercise in. And over time, oh, she got to know me. But you know what? It, that was okay. It was okay. And then I would go back and sit and pray, please fall asleep. No, Parkinson's has sleep disorder issues. So that's always been a problem. Her sleep waking me up in the middle of the night. But yeah, 
uh, leaf was always nice when we got it. I should have let her take more of her medication. I was trying to keep her from taking too much of whatever they gave her to calm down and for pain. I was always worried about her taking too much, but now I think back, I shouldn't let her have what she wanted. It wasn't even really that much to begin with. You know what? I, I think families struggle with that. And because she had Lewy bodies to me- dementia that usually goes with Parkinson's, I will tell you that the medication they gave her most likely would have had a paradoxal effect or an opposite effect and agitated her more than relax her. Because I've seen that in so many Lewy body dementia patients. I actually, I've heard that too, but not with her. It did relax her. I did. She also, she also got um, medical marijuana for her Parkinson's too. And that was a big help. That that was a blessing. It was a, yeah. absolutely a blessing. Yeah. Oh. That, that now, changed her completely. Yes. Yes. I, I find that medical marijuana is such a blessing for so many patients. And it's necessary. I hope in some day that it will become a federal regulation that it's all over the country because there are people struggling. It's a safe way to get something into your system, whether it's in a liquid form or smoking or whatever. And your parents were hippies, so they were okay with smoking pot or whatever. That was okay for them, and it was acceptable. I know with my dad, when he had pancreatic cancer, I was the only one of my siblings that probably didn't do drugs because I was in nursing school and was always getting tested, and I didn't have a need for it. Uh, right. I do now that I have money. I mean, I can't take pain <laughs> medication. I do. I don't live in a state where I, can, where I have it readily accessible to me, and I don't smoke, so that's another whole issue. But I can say that uh, my dad refused to take it. In fact, I told him, Dad, you're dying. I, I wanted him to have an appetite, and I wanted him to help him with his nausea. And I remember going to the local teenager. <laughs> I didn't know where to get him. My, my, my siblings were like, we're not getting it. We're employed now. They had been through their yeah. smoking marijuana phase. And I had never done it, so I didn't know where to go. So I went to the local teenagers and asked. And I got some product. And I can remember spending $100 on, on, for pot for my dad uh, to help him. And I remember him saying he was afraid he was going to get addicted. And I, yeah, I, I, I knew said, that, yes. And I said, Dad, you're dying. What does it matter if you're addicted? I just want you to feel better while you're dying. So did it help? And he flushed it down the toilet. He was so afraid of getting addicted. And it was oh, sad. But, you know, I'm thinking, oh, how sad is that? But you know what? I tried, and I respected it. We went on. I was very grateful that I had that opportunity to at least make an effort. My siblings were all upset with me because they were funny because I'd say, is this good stuff? How do we know it's good stuff? If I wouldn't know. I, I didn't know. And all I knew is what it smelled because in nursing school at the dorms, you could always smell it. And so I knew what it smelled, but I didn't know what good from bad looked like. And they were all like, we're not testing it, you know, because they were with companies that, that did testing on a regular basis. So I got a giggle from that, but right. nothing. I, I, I have to tell you that your health through all this took a big hit. I, I want to let people know the first time I met you, your dad started having the seizures. In fact, I was with him probably when he, we saw one of his first seizures. And I remember watching you. I could barely walk then. Your knees were so bad. You were struggling in managing your own health as well. And I was grateful that you were able to get care when you could. What did you do to take care of yourself during this time? Unfortunately, I don't think I went to any, maybe one or two doctors. I didn't go. I was a little concerned because I'm always taking them, but I couldn't go. But I did get some knee injections at the time and probably a little blood work. But after everything happened, I think I got more health problems after taking care of them. So that's a combination of age. I am aging and, and stress. And what I well, went through with them. 
Yes, caregiver stress and caregiver burden takes a big toll on our health. One of the things I have an issue with in our healthcare delivery system is we are taking our family members, our aging parents to the doctors, and we are the ignored, unpaid healthcare providers. The family caregiver is the largest home care provider in the country. Sure. And it's very sad because our healthcare system neglects the very person that is providing that care. And as a country have to address that and treat the family caregiver, they really do while they're getting seen, uh, when they're taking their family members to the doctors, the doctor should be able to provide some kind of testing and see you both at the same time, or at least have a conversation with you. Wouldn't that be awesome? That would just be so good. I, I think that it's got to be the future. It has to be. I hope so. I, I do too, Kim. I want to thank you for your time. I do want to do our next podcast on your experience with hospice, if we can. Okay. Yes. I, I, I'd like that to be our next one. So for now, I'm going to say thank you, Kim. You have been shared so much information to other caregivers out there that it may give them some hope and some tidbits of how to handle their own caregiving journey. For the caregivers out there, remember, you are the most important part of the caregiving journey. Without you, it all falls apart. So please be gentle with yourself. Practice self-care every day because you're worth it. Until next time, Kim. I love you, girl. I love you, too. Thank you. All right. Talk, talk to you soon. Okay. Bye. Bye.